Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are about to start our next rendition of uh, Nano Explorations. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Emily Toomey uh, from Carl Berggren's group. Uh, she is a doctor, Emily Toomey, as of a week and a half ago uh, when she defended her thesis. Uh, and uh, we will be treated to the highlights of that defense uh, at today's Nano Explorations. Uh, Emily, please take over. All right, let me share my screen. Great. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I'll uh, just make one more very quick announcement, which is that uh, please turn off your videos. It does speed up everyone else's uh, web connection. Uh, you can just say stop video on your end. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please hold them towards the very end, and you're going to be able to provide them to me either by sending a chat or indeed by raising a hand and I'll call upon you. But with that being said, Emily, please do take over. All right, uh, thank you. So I am part of Carl Bergen's group, the quantum nanostructure and nanofabrication group. And today I'm going to be talking about how we're using superconducting nanowires to develop an artificial neuron for spiking neural networks. So this project really grew from the fact that today we're facing a bit of a computing crisis due to the rapid expansion of technology that's really started with the development of silicon-based CMOS in 1963. So if you look at how technology has advanced since then, you have simple devices like the handheld calculator, but then microprocessors using space exploration, and then finally something as small and complex as the Apple Watch. But looking ahead to the type of technology that are currently being developed, we have things like autonomous vehicles, social media, the internet of things, all of which are requiring massive amounts of data at unprecedented rates. And the hard truth about that, is that the hardware that we've relied on to get us to this point is now struggling to keep up. So for instance, if you look at trends in microprocessor performance over the past 50 years or so, and we look at critical performance metrics, such as operation frequency here in green, or single thread performance here in blue, you can see that they once increased linearly with time up until about 2005, at which point they started flatlining due to issues with speeding and scaling limitations. So you can also look at this problem from an energy perspective. So here are projections for today's system level energy cost of computing in comparison to the world's total energy production. And you can see that based on projections, we're estimated to surpass the world's total energy production as early as 2035. So unless you're a huge optimist about the world's energy production suddenly increasing exponentially, we really need to rethink the way that we do computing in order to have more powerful, overall more energy efficient systems. And I think the way to do that is really a two-pronged approach. So the first is to investigate alternative computing schemes that are inherently more energy efficient and powerful. And in parallel with that is to re-examine our hardware to look beyond silicon for low dissipation materials that can then support these alternative computing schemes. So recently people have been inspired by the human brain as a source of inspiration for building an alternative architecture. So just for comparison, I've shown what our traditional architecture here on the left-hand side called the von Neumann architecture. And what I wanna draw your attention to is really you have this input and the output but more importantly, you have a separation between processing where things like logic and control happen and memory where information is stored. Now, in order to do any operation, this means that information has to be transferred between your processing and memory elements, which takes a certain amount of time. Now, the problem with that is that our processing has continued to speed up, but memory has kind of lagged behind. And so that time ends up becoming more and more of a problem, which we refer to as the memory bottleneck problem. Now, in comparison with our traditional von Neumann architecture, the human brain, by contrast, is highly power efficient. It's very parallel, meaning that one brain cell or neuron connects to hundreds of thousands of other neurons. And additionally, it communicates using spikes in comparison to the overall high-low signals that you have in traditional computing. And then furthermore, the memory and processing elements are actually united together within a single brain cell, which again is a huge contrast to the separation we have in our traditional architecture. So based on these appealing characteristics, people have been building what's called neuromorphic computing architectures inspired by the human brain. And perhaps the most biorealistic of uh, these types of architectures is called spiking neural networks, where you're trying to mimic the actual spiking dynamics of the human brain in order to compute 
for things like low power computing and machine learning. So you can do this in software where you actually encode all of these dynamics. Um, and this gives you very precise control. But once you start expanding to a very dense network, it becomes quite computationally expensive. So instead, what research have, researchers have been doing is looking at hardware approaches. So looking at devices and simple circuits that naturally generate this type of spiking behavior on their own. And so this has been explored in a wide variety of platforms, such as magnetic materials, PMOS, and then RISTR. And all of these have their own advantages, but all of these still struggle with power consumption in comparison to the performance that we see in the human brain. And so as a result, there remains a massive need for a low power hardware that can naturally generate spiking on its own in order to really see this alternative architecture through. And what I'm going to be arguing for today is using superconducting nanowires as a low power platform for these types of alternative architectures. So just to give a basic overview of how uh, superconducting nanowires operate, I've shown their current voltage plot here on the bottom left. So essentially when nanowires are in their superconducting state, we can pass current through them here on the x-axis without developing any voltage or resistance because they're superconducting. But eventually you reach a point called the critical current or switching current, at which point superconductivity breaks down. And in nanowires, this is a thermal process, so they undergo joule heating and they form what's called a resistive hotspot here now in this portion of the curve, where the resistance is actually quite high on the order of 1 to 10 kilo ohms. Now the nanowire stays in that resistive state until the hotspot cools down and you remove the bias current to a point that's called the retrapping current and then you regain superconductivity. So because you have this transition between this zero voltage superconducting state and this high impedance resistive state, nanowires are really great for driving large voltages while maintaining low power. Additionally, they have no static power dissipation in their interconnects, which has been a huge problem for CMOS architectures. So based on these features, um, they've been used for a variety of applications. Traditionally, they're used for single photon detection. And I've shown a scanning electron micrograph of one such device here on, on the bottom right. And you can see that they're quite small, which means that they're great for being densely packed for scaling. But more recently, in the past five to seven years or so, we've been taking advantage of the different characteristics to develop new circuit elements, so things like amplification and memory as well. So how do we understand these devices from an electrical engineering perspective? Um, well, kind of simply put, we have this transition between the superconducting and resistive states modeled as a resistor that's in parallel with the switch that shorts the ground. But what I want to draw your attention to is the series inductance here. Now, superconducting nanowires have this really unique feature where there's intrinsic inductance called kinetic inductance. And the important thing about that is that it scales with the length of the structure for a fixed width. So essentially, the longer your nanowire is, the higher your inductance is. And so you have this really great tunable circuit element that can be changed simply by changing the geometry of your structure. So why does that matter? Well, I mentioned not only do you need low power hardware, but you also need hardware that naturally generates spiking. And we can take advantage of this intrinsic inductance coupled with this transition between the superconducting and resistive states in order to generate spiking in our system. How we do this is that we put the nanowire in parallel with the shunt resistor here, labeled RS, and the bias current oscillates between the nanowire and the shunt as the nanowire, nanowire undergoes transitions in order to generate spiking. So up at the top here, I've shown kind of a simplified schematic of one such voltage pulse. You can see on the rising edge, it's quite steep, and that's what happens when the nanowire has transitioned into that resistive regime. The bias current is now being redirected from the nanowire into the shunt with a very fast L over R time constant, dominated by that kilo ohm impedance of our resistive hotspot. Now, conversely, on this much slower falling edge, that's what happens when the nanowire has regained the superconducting state. The bias current is now being redirected from the shunt into the nanowire. And that L over R time constant is dictated solely by the kinetic inductance of our nanowire and the R of our shunt resistor. So in my previous work, I studied kind of how these uh, oscillations are changed by L over R time constants. And what I found is that when you have an L over R time constant on the order of one to 10 nanoseconds, so you get sustained pulses, or what we call relaxation oscillations in our system. Now, relaxation oscillations certainly are not unique to superconducting nanowires. They're in a lot of physical systems, and perhaps the most uh, dominant one is the one within our own heads. So I mentioned that biological neurons have these electrical spikes called action potentials. And I've shown a simplified circuit schematic of that here. And I want to draw your attention to really this 
this rising edge and this falling edge of the action potential. Now, th this rising edge is what happens when what's called the sodium ion channel opens up and sodium floods into the cell, which raises its membrane potential. Conversely, on this falling edge, that's what happens when the potassium ion channel opens up and potassium floods out of the cell, which essentially resets it and allows it to fire again. So overall, you have this spiking that's dominated by these two voltage-gated ion channels. So we were inspired by this and decided to design our own nanowire-based spiking element, or SOMA, using two relaxation oscillators analogously to the two ion channels in a biological neuron. So I've shown the overall circuit schematic here, where you have this main oscillator, uh, which is analogous to the sodium ion channel, the potassium uh, oscillator here, and they're linked together within a superconducting loop. So to show you how this works in simulation, initially we have a bias current coming in from the top where we bias both oscillators right below the critical current so they don't switch. However, if we then send in an input current from the left-hand side, the control oscillator doesn't fire because the input current and the bias current are in opposite directions. But the main oscillator does fire because they sum along the same direction. So once it fires, it adds current into the superconducting loop, similar to the sodium influx. That then causes the potassium oscillator to fire in the opposite direction, removing current from the loop, like the potassium outflux. And so if we look at what happens with the overall loop current, you can see that it increases with the firing of the main oscillator and decreases with the firing of the control oscillator. So then the overall voltage signal that we're sending out is really the superposition of these two relaxation oscillators. So once we have a basic circuit schematic, we can start simulating what types of biorealistic characteristics we're able to achieve. And we explored a variety of them, but here I'm just highlighting the two that are pretty much universal to all biological neurons. So on the left-hand side, I've shown what's called um, the threshold response, meaning for a fixed uh, bias current or membrane potential, what's the minimum amount of input current required to get our neuron firing? And if you look here at the x-axis, you can see that we needed about more than four microamps of uh, current to get our neuron firing. On the right-hand side, I've shown what's called the refractory period. And we take that to mean the minimum amount of time between two input pulses, such that both elicit their own output spikes. So on this top panel, you can see the input pulses marked in red. You can see that there's sufficient amount of time between them, four nanoseconds, so that they both have their own output spikes. However, if we reduce that time by half now in the bottom panel, you can see that only that first input pulse elicits its own, elicits its own output spike. Um, that's because we've run into that refractory limit of our system, meaning that our main oscillator isn't fully biased by the time that second input pulse arrives. So once we have spikes being generated, how do we use that to control the behavior of a downstream neuron? So typically in a biological system, what happens is you have this slow chemical release of neurotransmitters in response to these rapid electrical pulses. So to mimic the same types of slow dynamics in our system, what we can do is use the charging and discharging of a large inductor to essentially accumulate current and then bleed that into the target neuron downstream. So I've shown two examples of that in action. On the left-hand side, we have a simulation of excitatory control, meaning that we're trying to get our target neuron firing. So the top panel shows we bias the main neuron in a positive direction. If you look now at the middle panel, we can see that we've accumulated about one microamp of current on that synapse inductor, which then causes that target neuron to fire. Conversely, for inhibitory control on the right-hand side, we can bias our main neuron in the negative direction. That accumulates a negative current on the synapse inductor, which then stops our neuron from firing. But having control isn't enough. A really important characteristic of the human brain is that we have changing connections between neurons all the time whenever we learn something or forget something. And similarly, for machine learning applications, we'd like to be able to have synapses that have different weights or strengths. So we need some type of tunability. And one way of doing that in our system is to take advantage of another form of nonlinearity in nanowires. And that's the relationship between kinetic inductance and bias current. And I've shown one of the original references here on the left, but essentially what they found is that if you run a modulating current through a nanowire close to its critical current, you can get an enhancement in inductance by about 20%. So it becomes like a tunable inductor. So we decided to incorporate a nanowire as a tunable inductor in parallel with our overall synapse and run a modulating current through it. That way, if we increase our nanowire inductance, we increase the overall parallel inductance of our synapse, which decreases the amount of current being sent to our target. So we're, essentially, we're reducing that synaptic strength. 
So to show an example of that uh, in action in our simulations, we have one main neuron connected to four different target neurons, each with their own individual synapses. Now initially, let's say we're trying to inhibit all four target neurons. So we can have all of the modulating currents turned off. And here now, if we look at the response on the right-hand side, we have our main neuron biased in the negative direction. So that now in the central panel, you can see that all the synaptic, uh, synaptic currents are about minus one microamps. So consequently, if you look at the um, output voltages in the bottom panel, which have been shifted on the y-axis for clarity, you can see that all four target neurons are inhibited for a short period of time. Now, let's say we don't care about target neuron number four anymore. We no longer want to inhibit it. Instead, what we can do is turn on its modulating current. And now, if we look at its synaptic current, which is here in this pink trace, you can see that it's receiving less current than the other three targets. So as a result, if you look at the voltage trace now, you can see that target neuron number four is no longer inhibited, but the other three targets remain inhibited. So not only are we able to get some level of parallelism in our circuit, but we're also able to get adjustable connectivity without disrupting the rest of, of our circuit. So once we have a synapse design, we can start making some basic estimates about its energy performance in comparison to existing technologies. And the typical figure of merit used in these systems is synaptic operations per second per watt, um, which is shown here on the right-hand side. And we compared the nanowire neuron in simulation to the human brain, and then also to two existing CMOS technologies, True North and NeuroGrid, out of IBM and Stanford, respectively. And you can see that based on our estimates, even when we include cooling costs, we have a figure of merit about four orders of magnitude better. Now, I want to be kind of cautious about these exact figure of merit comparisons because ours was achieved in simulation, whereas True North and NeuroGrid are actually measured on chip experimentally. Um, so I'm not taking these as kind of the final say in, in figure of merit, but really what we we're trying to show here is an argument for further development of the nanowire neuron as a technology that could potentially be very competitive from an energy standpoint. So once we have our design for the SOMA, we can actually start building it. And this is the exciting part. Um, so I won't go into too many details about the fabrication process, but I can certainly answer them afterwards. So essentially, we had two electron beam lithography steps. The first was to pattern the um, titanium gold resistors that served as the shunt resistors. And then the second was after we deposited our superconducting film, which was niobium nitride, um, was patterning those nanowire structures. So here's our scanning electron micrograph of an example of a fabricated soma. You can see that we have this main oscillator and the control oscillator, which are now linked together within a superconducting loop, with our input signal coming in from the left, the bias coming in from the top, and the output signal going in from the right. And I should mention this is done in positive cone resist, so everything in dark gray is now being nitride, and then these uh, light gray outlines are all the underlying thermal oxide. So if we zoom in on one of these oscillators just to see what it looks like, you can see we have our very narrow 60 nanometer switching element in series with these long nanowire inductors in order to get these longer L over R time constants for relaxation oscillations. And all of that's in parallel with our titanium gold shunt resistor. So the first thing we can do experimentally is look at the response of the soma to the input pulse and compare it to what we get in simulation. So I've shown the simulation on the top and the experimental on the bottom. And you can see that we have pretty good agreement, uh, both in terms of amplitude and frequency of, of our signals. Um, we can also look at reproducibility of these pulses. So the top trace shows an example of when the soma spiked three times over the duration of an input pulse. And I've marked the two inch spike intervals as delta T1 and delta T2. Now, if we take 100 sequential captured waveforms and kind of time tag when all of these voltage pulses occur, we actually get a histogram for each of the individual peaks. So there's some timing jitter. And on the right-hand side, if we take an overall histogram of delta T1 and delta T2, we can see that we had a mean interspike interval of about 50.4 nanoseconds, with the standard deviation of about 6.5 nanoseconds. And this is actually comparable to what you get in human motor neurons, where the standard deviation is about 5 to 10% of the mean interspike interval. So we're able to get some biorealistic timing characteristics out of our system as well. Um, additionally, we can look at firing probability, and we measured this on the y-axis as a mean voltage output of 500 sequential measurements, meaning that if the SOMA fires more often, its mean voltage output is higher. And we measured this as a function of input current here on the x-axis. And each of these individual uh, traces corresponds to a different bias current or resting current. 
And the important takeaway from this is that in comparison to that simulated threshold measurement where we got that really clean step-like behavior, here we're getting something that's much more S-shaped or sigmoidal, and that's actually due to the underlying stochastic nature of nanowire switching. So I kind of lied to you in the beginning when I said that nanowires have this critical current that they switch at. What happens really experimentally is that because nanowires are susceptible to thermal and quantum fluctuations, when you measure their transition point over and over again, you actually get a histogram or a distribution of the switching point because they have this firing probability. And so when you map that onto this type of measurement, you end up getting a more F-shaped type of behavior. Now, this might seem like a bad thing because typically in circuits, we don't want anything stochastic. But as I'll show you a little bit later, biological neurons actually have firing probabilities as well. And so certain types of algorithms and applications take advantage of stochasticity in the system um, for their own type of operation. And so nanowires are actually a great platform for these types of applications because they inherently have some type of sigmoidal function or firing probabilities in them. So the last thing we measured experimentally was the refractory period, which again is the minimum amount of time between two input pulses such that both have their own output spikes. And I've shown the simulation on the left-hand side and the experiment on the right. And you can see initially the two pulses in red are well separated in time, so we get two output spikes in blue. If we bring them closer together, we still have two output spikes. Closer together still, we still have two output spikes. But eventually we reach a point at which we're only getting one output spike in both the simulation and the experiment. And when you look at what's happening in the simulation, you can see that by the time that first action potential has ended, we've already reached the end of our second input pulse. So we've actually run into that refractory limit of our system. And of course, if you increase that overlap even further, you're still only getting one output spike. And if we repeat this measurement 200 times and record the time at which each of these spikes occur, you see that we initially have these two well-defined histograms based on the two individual output spikes we're getting. But eventually that collapses into one as we run into that refractory limit of our system. So now that we have an experimentally measured SOMA and we've adjusted our circuit model and simulation to match our experimental results, we can start simulating what types of applications our SOMA could be used for. And so I want to end my talk by focusing on two applications that we simulated where the nanowire neuron might be useful. And the first is probably what's most conventionally done with spike neural networks, which is pattern recognition. And here we've taken a data set that's been used to test memristors and Josephson junctions. It's essentially a set of 30 images representing the letters Z, V, and N in a three by three pixel array. And each of these images has its own ideal representation and also nine single pixel error images. And our goal is to build a network of nine pixel neurons and three output letter neurons. So that if we present any of the images to the nine pixel neurons, the correct output letter neuron should fire. Meaning if we present the ideal Z image to each of the nine pixel neurons, only that Z output letter neuron should fire. And furthermore, if we present any of the error images of Z, still only that Z output letter neuron should fire. Now, how do we kind of understand these pixels? Well, as shown on the right-hand side here, um, we're actually mapping the color of the pixel to the input current of that neuron. And so we chose to have gray represent a non-zero input current and white represent a zero input current. So here's our overall system. You have, again, these nine pixel neurons where the input currents are determined by the color of that, of that pixel for that image. And we have our three output letter neurons here on the right. And here we have our inductive synapses. And I mentioned again that in our system, the strength of our synapse it relates to the magnitude of the inductance. And so we solve for the synaptic weights externally in a Python code and then use that to map onto the inductances of our circuit simulations. And then the currents are inductively coupled between the pixels and our output letter neurons. And so here is the overall results of our system. And so the first nine rows here are representing the input currents to each of the nine pixels. And the outputs of the three letters are shown in the bottom here. Just to kind of walk you through a little bit, that first column represents the ideal Z image. And you can see the code of that ideal Z image here corresponds to each of the input currents being received by the pixels. And if you look at the output, you can see that only that Z neuron fires, meaning that it correctly identifies its ideal image. And then the nine subsequent columns are for each of those single pixel error images. And you can see that the Z neuron still fires. Afterwards, we represent, or we send in all of the uh, Z images, and you can see that it's first the Z ideal image and the Z neuron fires, and then finally all of the N images. And so we correctly identified all 30 of our images in our set. 
Um, now, I want to be clear, this isn't an example of learning. This is more of an example of inference where we pre-solve for all the ways ahead of time. But what we're kind of showing here is that the nanowire neuron platform um, could be used as a low power inference platform for image recognition purposes. So finally, the last application I'll talk about is perhaps a more biorealistic application, and it's called the winner takes all uh, simulation. And the idea behind it is that in our heads, we have hundreds of thousands of neurons. And at the same time, we're receiving thousands of input signals from everything we taste, touch, see, smell, et cetera. And if all of your neurons fire in response to all of these input signals, the overall result and message is kind of meaningless. It's hard to make any distinction. Ideally, what you'd like to happen is to have only a select number of neurons fire. And in that way, you're able to make some type of discernment or decision. A simpler way to look at it is that if you have a set of inputs that map to their own set of outputs, if all of the output signals uh, fire and go into the overall message, again, it's kind of meaningless. And so eventually what you'd like to have happen is to have only, let's say, one of the output signals be firing. And then that way you can kind of make a decision or some type of discernment. So there's different ways of how the brain does this. So one possible model is called um, the two inhibitor winner takes all network. And the idea is, again, you have these sets of inputs mapping to these sets of outputs. And here, the blue arrows represent excitatory connections, and the red arrows represent inhibitory connections. And all of the outputs share a set of two inhibitors. The idea is that if all of the inputs start firing, all of the outputs then start firing. But they then turn on these two inhibitors, which starts trying to suppress all the outputs until just one of them remains. Now, the two inhibitors have uh, different roles. The convergence inhibitor here fires when at least two outputs are active, and it really fosters that competition. And the stability inhibitor fires um, once there is a winner and it continues to fire as long as just one output is active. And it basically keeps the other one suppressed. Now, a really important characteristic of this is that the output neurons are stochastic, meaning that it's a probabilistic scenario of which one wins. So to incorporate that into our model, we actually matched our experimental firing probabilities to our simulated firing probabilities by incorporating noise into our system. So I'll show you an example of a winner-takes-all simulation um, with our three input neurons connecting to three output neurons and our two inhibitors. So initially what happens is you have all three inputs start firing. If you look at the bottom, all three outputs are firing as well. And eventually Y1 is the only output neuron firing, meaning that it's a winner of that competition. And if you look at what's happening with the stability inhibitors, you can see that the stability inhibitor, ZS, continues to fire basically keeping the other two suppressed. But the convergence inhibitor has only fired as long as two output neurons are firing. And again, this is a probabilistic scenario, so any of the output neurons have a chance of winning. So if you repeat this uh, simulation, you have examples like on the left-hand side where Y2 wins, or examples like on the right-hand side where Y3 wins. And if you repeat this result many, many times and record uh, which neuron wins which competition, you can see that Y2, Y1, and uh, Y3 all win roughly the same amount of time because this is a probabilistic scenario. And so these types of simulations or these types of networks can be used for applications like learning and decision making. And what we're trying to highlight here is how it's a great example of how you can take advantage of inherent stochasticity or probability in neurons uh, to have a unique purpose. So finally, where do we go from here? Um, well, in this talk, I really focused on what's the processing element of our alternative architecture, which is this low power, naturally spiking hardware. And I showed that it has possible network applications in things like image recognition and the modeling of biorealistic dynamics. And the other part of uh, our work, which I didn't really get to talk about today, was the memory element that we're also forming from nanowires. And our overall vision is to really bring this memory and processing element closer together in the same platform and even within the same fabrication step in order to have faster, more efficient computation that no longer has this memory bottleneck issue. And kind of in parallel with that is to continue to be inspired by these natural dynamics of superconducting nanowires and really investigate how we can harness them to develop new computing architectures and devices. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention and I'm open to any questions. So thank you, Emily. I enjoyed the presentation. This is Craig Keast. Actually, I actually have a couple questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. One is when you were doing sort of the energy comparisons to, to CMOS spiking, I guess, neuron circuits, mm -hmm. um, 
what was the sort of the cooling factor that you were using? In yeah. Those so in our case, um, in our case, we use a factor of 400 watts per watt, and we test our devices at 4.2 Kelvin. Okay. So that's and, the and also, from, I guess a, a related question from an area density standpoint. Mm -hmm. How does the area of your uh, superconducting nanowire spiking neurons compared to sort of a, a modern very, CMOS yeah. equivalent? That's a good question. So in this case, we're not optimizing for, for area yet. So as you saw with our um, Soma cell design, it's actually quite large. Um, in this case, it was about 20 microns across. Um, and that was mostly limited by the size of our inductors. So we could kind of continue optimizing for area by, um, first of all, increasing our oscillation frequency um, by reducing our arguments, and then also by using a thinner film, which has a higher um, sheet inductance, which kind of would allow us to shrink our overall cell size. Um, so in this particular example, um, for our proof of concept device, we're not optimizing for area yet. And I think eventually, you know, with our synapse design here, that also takes up a good amount of area. And so it's going to come really between a uh, decision between energy efficiency and overall density, I think. Uh, maybe, maybe I can Thank have you. a follow-up question to that. Um, so the, the, uh, one of the energy losses, right, in integrated si systems would be the capacitive energy loss uh, between, and in the wires that connect uh, different elements of your system. Uh, are your wires that connect your different neurons also superconducting, hence that's not an issue? Right, that would be our goal is to have super connecting interconnects so that we're not running into those types of losses. So in that case, would area density really be an issue, uh, given the fact that uh, distance is not uh, being reflected in an extra energy loss? Um, potentially, I mean, I was thinking more of just the overall like cell size itself. I mean, it is larger than what we'd like it to be because it's on the order of like, 20 microns or so, and that is still taking up more area than I think we would like in a final design. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood if I'm answering your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if your R is very small, your RC time constant would mm -hmm. be, uh, or, you know, also very, very small. And hence, uh, I would expect that you wouldn't suffer as quite as much capacitive loss in the process, but yeah, that might be a yeah. wrong assumption. No, I think um, we overall would have um, lower interconnect loss for, for sure. Is, is there also a sense on how does this scale compare to, I mean, you started with a plot emphasizing by 2030 we'll run out of energy to actually provide for computational power of the planet. Uh, would you be able to address it uh, using these systems? Uh, do you actually, like if you look at power uh, usage uh, to do a computation, would this be the way to go about it? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So in this case, we've really only looked at the overall energy costs of um, like a simple operation really connecting two and four neurons. Um, so we haven't looked at it in terms of an actual computation cost. One of our concerns that we have to look into is, is really in like a full network because we're using um, bias current uh, devices is the cost of distributing that bias current. And I think that will be our biggest concern moving forward to forming like a full expanded network. And if you look at other um, superconducting circuits as well, like those using Joseph's injunctions, that ends up being kind of a considerable cost. So we haven't factored that in to, to our system yet. Um, so we don't have those estimates, but that's what we're kind of most wary of. Uh, there is a chat question by Stephen Philippone. Uh, Stephen, I could read your question or would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask it? Sorry, it's a little loud here, so maybe I'll be quick, mm -hmm. but basically, no, uh, thank you for that talk. Oh, sorry, uh, we're having to cross How does here. this compare to <laughs> uh, RAM based cross bar I arrays? I mean, you already sort of commented on the device size, but maybe you'd correct. like to say more about Just other aspects and comparisons between those so two approaches. The concept and the uh, yes, thank you. I think I heard most of that. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question. So I guess um, our biggest thing with this is that sometimes like in a lot of RAM crossbar arrays in order to do spiking you need additional peripheral circuitry and in this case ours would kind of all be an inherent part of the device um, but something that we should we should point out or maybe I should emphasize a little bit more is that we don't yet have a, a scheme for, for for learning in these types of systems and so that is our 
kind of an area that we're, we're currently working on um, with some, some students have been brought on board is, you know, we have some tunability, but we don't actually have um, a learning mechanism yet. And so other um, approaches have started to incorporate those and shown those in, in their work experimentally. And so we're kind of actively developing that in our system. Um, if you have additional questions, please raise your hand or send me a chat. Um, the present way of making uh, the neurons is by using superconducting thin films uh, on silicon, uh, which would imply that this might be uh, compatible with a present lithography uh, uh, processes or CMOS processes. Uh, is that the case? And how integratable is this with the digital logic? Yeah, no, we think it's, it would definitely be um, able to be integ integrated as long as you can you know, get the, the feature size. Um, I mean, previously in our other work, we've done these same superconducting processes on tops of, of other chips that have, you know, like magnetic memory elements. Um, so we've shown that these types of processes are quite compatible. Um, so that's kind of one of the advantages of superconductors. And superconducting nanowires specifically, actually, because they have these high impedances, um, they're able to be interfaced with CMOS devices, which other um, Superconducting devices like Joseph's injunctions have a hard time doing that type of integration because their impedances are much lower. And so one of the things that we always like to say about nanowires is that they're a really great interfacing technology as well because they can kind of move between the superconducting and semiconducting worlds. Uh, so I'll, there are two more questions. I'll ask one of them uh, and then I'll open up the floor for the other, uh, which is uh, uh, comparing your technology to Memristor technology. Uh, would you be able to do that? Um, I guess in, in terms of what what respects for I, I, I guess the the memory technology itself has a capability of uh, remembering or call it uh, in a oh. way of making decision making. Yeah. Uh, how would you uh, say uh, you know side by side comparison between the two? Which one should I choose? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I have uh, enough prepared to do like a full side by side comparison. I mean, the way that we incorporate memory in our systems is a little bit different. Um, I didn't get to talk about it today, but that's the other part of my thesis work. And that's using basically superconducting loops where we trap persistent current and that becomes a state of our memory. And it can stay there, you know, indefinitely as long as you don't break that loop. And so in our types of systems, you know, we could potentially incorporate that as the modulated current in our synapse inductor to basically store, to store that there. And so that would be um, kind of our idea of memory in these types of systems. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess just uh, to follow on to that, the packing density of that is very much dependent on how much the heat spreads uh, from your uh, heating current, right? I mean, you apply the current to break the superconductivity in your uh, uh, nanowires. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, I guess uh, the spatial extent of that heating is microns or which uh, depth? Yeah, it, it would be smaller than that. It's on the order of hundreds of nanometers. Okay. Um, so that would be one consideration. And um, the other thing is really like the inductance of our system. So all of our oscillations are based on having long enough L of R time constants that you're having these sustained relaxation oscillations. And so it's really just making sure that the inductance is, is large enough to support that. Um, and so we, again, we haven't optimized for that in this particular design. So it was still quite a large cell size, but we could definitely make it smaller. Uh, there's a question from Umit Sami, uh, if you'd like to unmute and ask it. Oh, yeah. Um, hi. Thank you, Valerian. Thank you, Emily. Uh, my question is really about the, your last slide. You said that you want to bring it together, you know, the computing part with the memory, uh, which, mm -hmm. is a, which is a holy grail of neuromorphic computing, I would say, in many aspects. But one of the challenges there is uh, how do we do uh, non-binary computing, right? So if you have a memory cell, how do you actually store values beyond zero and one? Today, it's in, for instance, from your slides, I, I noticed that it's a spiking. And so you have a high resistivity or, or low resistivity, which corresponds to ones and zeros. But what if you could do one zero and something in between, right? And that opens up the, the, uh, the paradigm for, for AI-based, hardware-based architectures. And what, what would be your approach, is my question, to achieve that kind of a, a non-binary multi-value uh, neuromorphic computing? Um, thanks, that's a great question. Um, so I guess we've been most thinking about non-binary from the standpoint of memory, kind of as we were talking about. And actually the part of my work that I didn't get to talk about today was about turning our binary nanowire memory into a multi-level memory cell. 
So we've been able to show that we can have multi-levels trapped uh, in a superconducting loop. And we can do that controllably and we can change the number of states just simply by changing some of our circuit parameters. Um, so we're actually able to do um, non-binary memory in, in nanowires. Oh, interesting. Very cool. Uh, if I can uh, maybe conclude with a last question. This is from uh, Akash Deep Kamara. Um, Akash Deep, uh, uh, Deep uh, would you like to unmute and ask a question? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so your desired IV characteristics and similar, uh, the actual device IV characteristics obviously are somewhat different in terms of the noise. I was wondering in your simulations, is it possible to add noise to the simulation itself to check the robustness against it? And have you done that? Um, yeah, those are great questions. So we added noise actually to our simulation um, in order to do like the winner takes all example, uh, basically in order to incorporate a firing probability into into our model so that it doesn't always fire the exact uh, critical current. And that's kind of the only way you can get that winner takes all um, sit, like situation to work out um, because all three of your output neurons are identical. And so that's one way we incorporated noise into our simulations. And we essentially had two Gaussian white noise sources and we, uh, for each uh, SOMA, and we swept the magnitude of that until the firing probabilities naturally got experimentally. Um, and so that's one way that we, we incorporated noise in our system. And we kind of made sure that the histograms that we get from measuring that switching point many times corresponded to what we get experimentally as well. All right. Uh, Emily, uh, thank you very, very much for a fantastic talk and great set of answers to uh, multitudes of questions. So I very much appreciate you participating in this version of Nano Explorations. Uh, again, uh, you can uh, voice your reaction by indeed clicking on it if you wish. Uh, and again, thank you so much uh, for participating in today's Nano Explorations as an audience listening to a great talk by Emily to me. To me. Um, I'll just alert you that the upcoming Nano Explorations is uh, this coming Thursday at 11 o'clock, uh, and the topic is 2D material-enabled multifunctional mid-IR optoelectronics. Join us for that. Uh, we'll hopefully see you then. Thank you all very much. Well done. Thank you.